Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Ireland Park Foundation. My name is Mary Margaret McMahon. I know it should be McWoman. I'm working on changing that. I'm happy to be your MC today. This is the first of many virtual activities that we will be doing on a monthly basis with Ireland Park Foundation. So we'll be doing them virtually until we can carouse with you uh, together in person once again, bring on that vaccine. And so please stay in touch uh, either through our electronic newsletter, our website, the stinking social media, the word of mouth, um, any way you can. We're happy to always have you join us. This afternoon, we ha are hosting an exciting event, a scintillating conversation with two very inspirational women. But first, some light housekeeping. So your audio and video are, are muted, um, but you should be able to see the panelists and hear the panelists. Um, the chat is also turned off, but for any technical difficulties, please log on to the Q&A and we will be able to see the Q&A and to help you as well. Later on, um, if you have any probing questions to ask any of our uh, panelists, we would endeavor to answer those uh, time permitting and you can just pop them in the Q&A as well. We will be recording tonight's um, festivities for our YouTube channel for anyone who missed this great opportunity. And um, we're also curious as to where you are from. Um, so if you don't mind revealing your whereabouts, um, you can put those in the Q&A as well your town, your city, your village, um, your living room couch, wherever you are. And that'd be great for us to know. And now without any further ado, I would like to introduce you to the ever charming, ever illustrious, extraordinarily passionate founder and strong, super strong advocate of all things Ireland Park, Mr. Robert Kearns. Thank you, Mary Margaret. Very kind introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's uh, great to have so many people here this evening uh, to introduce you to um, to introduce Margaret uh, Stewart and Mary McAleese. Um, I believe we have people from uh, California. Uh, our new Irish ambassador to Canada, Eamon McKee, in Ottawa. Uh, people from Ireland and uh, all over uh, different parts of Canada. So a very, very warm welcome to you. So we are celebrating the uh, pre-Christian Celtic tradition of Imbolc, which was a festival of Bridget. Now, if she was a Canadian uh, goddess, she'd be frigid, I suspect, at this time of year, because it is not uh, the beginning of spring in Canada just yet. But uh, Imbolc was that point between the summer, uh, between the winter solstice and the spring equinox. And she was associated with many aspects of wisdom, protection of crops and animals and fertility. Um, the, uh, the, the chroniclers of uh, the ninth century uh, described uh, Bridget as uh, the goddess who, who was adored by the poets. And she had two sisters, uh, Bridget the Smith and Bridget the Healer. Uh, so in many respects, that is a very perfect segue for me to introduce uh, uh, Mary McAleese, former president of Ireland, professor of uh, canonical studies, uh, an extraordinary uh, academic and statesperson. Uh, we are so happy to have you with us this evening. It's a great honor. Um, Mary was born in Belfast in the early 50s. Uh, she's a graduate of Queen's University. Uh, she was one of the first three women called to the bar in Northern Ireland in 1974. Uh, she had a distinguished academic career in law in Northern Ireland and later on in Trinity College Dublin. And she then ran for election uh, as president of Ireland in 1997, succeeding the first woman elected president of Ireland, Mary Robinson. So the following year, Mary came to Toronto and many of us here in the Canadian community had an opportunity to meet her, particularly at St. Michael's College, where she recently gave the, uh, the inaugural Darcy McGee lecture. And it was her first visit uh, electronically, of course, uh, back to St. Mike since uh, 
1998. So Mary has strong connections with Canada uh, that include many members of her family in Nova Scotia. In fact, I recall her saying that she was probably related to nearly everybody in Nova Scotia. So we hope to see you in Canada more often. Uh, in her second term of office, uh, Mary very graciously agreed to be patron of Ireland Park Foundation and indeed to travel to Canada in 2007 for the opening of Ireland Park on the 21st of June. And the two or three days on either side of that event uh, were, were days that none of us will ever forget. So um, after Mary stepped down as president in 2011, it was a, 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 a two-term presidency. And um, in fact, uh, I seem to recall uh, Mary saying that she had a visit to a school in Ireland where a young girl said to her, um, you've been president for a long time and the, your predecessor was a woman. Um, can men be elected as president uh, in Ireland? And I think that's a, a very clear statement of the, the change in roles for, for women over the last hundred years in Ireland and one that we so welcome and applaud. Um, Mary has gone on to, uh, to another a doctorate in canonical law in the Vatican. She's a profound scholar of the history of Christianity and the Catholic Church. She's an advocate for women in the Catholic Church, and she has drawn many important issues to the attention of all members of the Catholic Church, right up to the Pope and onwards. So um, we welcome that. In her presidency, she was a bridge builder. Um, she reached out and brought together polarized communities in a way that no, none of her predecessors have been able to do, but she had unique skills to do that. And so you are such a champion of so many issues on the island of Ireland and an inspiration uh, for young Irish men, young and old, <laughs> around the world, uh, both here in Canada and in Ireland. So we are very grateful for your patronage in the past and for your presence here this evening. Uh, and, you know, to, in, to speak with you this evening, we wanted to welcome uh, a more recent visitor, uh, a more recent uh, Irish Canadian in the last 20 years, that is, uh, uh, Margaret Stewart, to join you in a conversation. Margaret is born in Dublin and is a graduate of Trinity College. Um, you're a university, of course, Mary, that you're very familiar with. Margaret's journey to Canada had a circuitous route. Uh, going to Britain and then subsequently to Philadelphia and then Philadelphia to Berlin, to Germany, uh, uh, not Berlin, but to Germany, and then back to uh, the United States. And uh, while uh, uh, then she came to Canada and uh, had a su very successful career in the technology industry in Toronto. And then subsequently on a bicycling expedition in California, she met her future husband and now lives permanently in Toronto. So Margaret, we're so grateful to you for joining us uh, this evening to speak with, uh, with Mary McAleese. Um, um, Margaret, of course, is now the country head for Salesforce Canada and is a, a leader in developing and expanding the operations of Salesforce and uh, has risen to a very senior position in the company overall. So we congratulate you on that. Again, you inspire uh, young women, young men uh, in, in Canada and in Ireland. And we are so grateful for your thoughts and insight. And so if I may, I'd like to hand over to both of you now to enjoy a conversation uh, on all the many opportunities uh, that we can look forward to as soon as this pandemic is behind us. Thank you. Hello, Mary. Hi, there you are. Nice to nice to see you virtually. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much I am. for joining us. Is invisible. <laughs> yes, we're both visible, and I think we everybody can hear us. Wonderful. So, Mary, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. It, it's it's been a year like no other for all of us. And so many of the people that are joining on this call, they've missed their normal trip home to Ireland. So how are things in Ireland? How are things in Roscommon? Well, I'm living on the banks of the Shannon in North Roscommon. It's very beautiful. So we're allowed to walk 5K from home. So I have very beautiful 5K walks, but 
the, the real big excitement of the week, I have to say, since all the shops are closed, apart from essential services and pharmacies and, and uh, supermarkets, the big excitement of the week is pushing the trolley around the supermarket um, and bemoaning the fate that um, means that you can't, can't see the kids, can't see the grandkids, can't go to see my mom who's going to be 90 in a month's time. And, you know, but thank God for things like this, because between FaceTime and Zoom, uh, we keep in touch with friends and family. But, you know, it's, it is a very frustrating time. And I feel, I really feel me even complaining about those small things because there are people, you know, who have had to suffer death and serious illness uh, and, and all that goes along with the funerals that we, you know, you know what we're like about funerals in Ireland. Funerals are big in Ireland. We love to hug and tell stories and you can't even, you can't go to the hospital to see your people who are dying. You can't hold their hands. You can only have 10 people at a funeral. It's, Oh, that's a nightmare. And then, of course, all the people who are, you know, dealing with loss of business, their little businesses are closed and they don't know when they'll open again. Uh, we have a lovely little cafe close by us here that we love to go to for breakfast every so often. And we can't do that. And there's a gang of us older ones meet up there. You know, we just we just salute each other, say hi and have a bit of a conversation and a coffee. And those little things that make us realise to be honest, Margaret, how much we need each other, you know, how much our lives are enhanced by just everyday social meeting up and chatting and being interested in other people. Yeah, no, I, and that it's it's a pretty, pretty similar story in Toronto these Is days. It? Is it the same? It, it, it's very similar. We're very much in lockdown. You cherish your long dog walks that's your chance to put on a mask and go and yes. meet folks in the ravine. I actually found myself at Christmas. I always loved going to the, the shopping mall at Christmas. It was closed. So I found myself spending an hour with the shopping cart in the supermarket, listening to Christmas songs. And that was my shopping. That was my oh, Christmas moment. But so similar. It brings us together in some ways, but very similar. So enough about COVID for now. We're all getting through it. Um, it, it, when, when I read through, here's my here's the story. Thank you so much for sharing so much of you as as you wrote the book. And and are there is there a place in your story that really set you up for leadership? An experience that you had growing up that you would point to that really set you up for the phenomenal leadership that you've had. I I suspect, and I cannot be sure. But it may have something to do with being the oldest of nine children, um, you know, in a very busy household. And um, have, my mother's one of 11 children and she and her siblings between them have 60 children, six zero. My family thought they had to increase, multiply and fill the earth all by themselves. And so there's loads of them. And we all lived really, you know, quite close to one another. Uh, we were very um, clannish in the sense that, you know, we were very convivial. Uh, nobody phoned you to say they were arriving. Nobody waited on a Zoom invitation to turn up. They just turned up in numbers. And um, so I think being um, being the oldest, and particularly I think being a girl oldest, um, you just had to take responsibility. Also, and you know, t towards the end, when my, my my mother had eleven pregnancies by the time she was thirty eight, um, at nine live children, and at the end of that, she wasn't so well. In fact, for the last few years. Um, of our childbearing years, um, she wasn't so well. And so that kind of thrust responsibility, you know, onto myself and my next sister. So I think you just, you know, you shape up because if you didn't shape up, you'd be in trouble, you know, you'd be expected to. And I had, a, you know, my grandmother who lived just down the road from us and was the mother herself of 11 children. And, you know, she had grown up in relatively, you know, good circumstances, you know, what, not, not well to do, but but um, but comfortable circumstances on a farm in the in the Dramara Hills uh, near the Moors, and you know she was one of three children. There was money, there was food, and then she marries and uh, she lives in a two up two down house, you know, in a working class area in Belfast with eleven children, and uh, and she and my grandfather were madly in love all their lives. They adored each other. And uh, so, it was a, so they had that wonderful, strong relationship and she never complained. She just knitted, sewed, baked, got on with it, never just, just pushed on through life uh, with a smile on her face and uh, joy in life. And I think I probably, I was always very close to her. 
you know, um, I was probably the, the nearest grandchild to live to her, if you like. So I saw her every day. She and I were big mates. And I, I probably modeled myself to some extent on her and picked up a lot of, you know, picked up a lot of her, her attitudes, I think. So you had some lovely role, mo role models and yeah, like being the models. oldest and I, you had some great leadership responsibility foisted from a, an early age. So that puts you in good stead going forward. And, yeah, and it also creates problems because when I got married to my husband, I was married at 24, Martin and I got married at 24 and uh, discovered after, and he was a real sporty person, you know, he was into football and he was trim and slim. At the end of the year, he'd put on three stone because I couldn't cook for two people. I could cook for 22 and did every day, but I couldn't cook for two people. And oh. eventually he figured out the only way to solve this problem is to buy her a freezer. So he bought me a freezer the first Christmas we were married and that sort of half solved the problem. Oh, that's great. Good on Martin. He had, he had the right solution. So when you move on from your early days in one, one of nine, um, I'll, I'll tell you when I grew up in Dublin in Clontarf and I aspired to be a lawyer all the way through secondary school. I had a wonderful dad, but he had a best friend who was a solicitor who told him that law is not for women. Oh, so yeah. I studied computer science. So did well, you, you made a good barriers? choice. Well, I you did. In choice. retrospect, it was great. But yeah. did you have any barriers in your first career? Well, I had, I had exactly the same experience as you. I, I was 14 or 15 when I first, I was asked by our local parish priest, a Dubliner, may I say. Uh, any, I don't know if anybody in Canada can get um, the series Father Ted. Can you get Father oh, Ted in Canada? Yes, yes. And if you remember in that, there's a guy called Father Jack. Yes. Um, and um, played by the wonderful late Frank Kelly. And uh, Frank Kelly's uncle was our parish priest, Father Honorius. I will say no more, but he used to come to our house on regular pastoral visits that seemed to have more to do with the availability in our house of whiskey, because my father had a small pub mm -hmm. and there was always whiskey in the house uh, for you know a visiting parish priest um, or a visiting uh, Protestant minister, because my, my father's best friend who lived up the road from us was a local, um, uh, Church of Ireland minister, uh, who also liked to share a baby powers with him now and then. But when Father Honorius, I was about 14 or 15, and it was quite commonplace then, Margaret, for, you know, for young women, particular, well, for anybody really, to leave school at around 15 and go to work uh, when I was growing up. That was not uncommon. And we were the first generation who benefited from free, free second level education. So we were the first that had the opportunity to also go on, you know, um, to third level. And um, so he asked me, I was, I was 14 or 15, what was I going to do? Thinking that I probably was going to join an aunt of mine. My aunt had a hairdressing salon. I had two aunts down the road who had a hairdress, who each had hairdressing salons. One was where my mother met my father. She was a, an apprentice to his aunt who was a hairdresser. And uh, I used to spend the odd Saturday helping my other aunt, you know, brush hairs and wash hairs and all that kind of stuff and look after the towels and those kinds of things. So I guess he thought that that's what I was going to do. Um, and so, no, I said, look, um, I, I, I'm going to stay on at school. I'd, I'd like to become a lawyer. And he immediately, without even drawing breath, he said to me, um, oh, that can't, you can't do that. He said, that's not possible. Uh, he said, there are two reasons. One, that you're a woman. And two, because you've nobody belonging to you in the law. And my mother, who was so always so deferential to priests, still is at 90, um, you know, she she absolutely suddenly became incensed and she ordered him out of the house and she told me just to ignore him. And it's the only career advice she ever gave me um, or indeed that I ever got from either parent. And it was the best career advice I ever got just to stick with my plan. And so I did. But, you know, I have to say, I also have to redeem him, Margaret, because um, short, uh, you know, a few years later, three years later, four years later, when I got into university and got into law school, he was so pleased for me and proud. Um, and another girl in his part of the parish um, had, um, had got, she got into UCD, University College Dublin. And he took the two of us out for dinner um, to celebrate. Rather regret, we had a wonderful dinner. I'd never been taken out to dinner before, incidentally. This was a real treat. I'd never had any such thing. And um, when we came back into the parish, unfortunately, it was August the 14th. 1969 when all hell broke loose mm. literally all hell broke loose and we arrived back to the parish in flames and uh, police officers god help us you know members of the police force uh, pointing out catholic homes and 
help, uh, helping um, loyalist paramilitaries um, and in the very early days of the troubles um, to set fire to them. And, and, I, and, and I'm thinking, you know, these are the forces of law and order. And, yes. I, you know, and I want to be a lawyer and I believe in the force of the law and I believe in the rule of law. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a really strange time. Wow. So, so you, you had such exposure to such violence, such sectarianism, yes. but yes, yet when you became president, your theme was building bridges. And so you opened up the Auris, you listened deeply to many, to many people who'd never been heard before. And it was very much challenging the status quo of how to be a leader and how to be a president of Ireland. But where did you find the courage to persevere and keep doing that and make it happen. That came out of my direct experience of, of watching um, the community around me disintegrate into sectarian violence, into appalling sectarian violence. I lived in a parish which had and has still the highest incidence of sectarian murders during the Troubles. So literally, you know, you know on a daily basis, weekly basis, um, there were sectarian murders carried out awful. Um, some of them uh, good friends of mine. Uh, who died, um, and then my own family experienced a lot of, um, you know, we have a, quite a, a string of sectarian attacks, you know, from attack on the house, an attack on my brother who was deaf, uh, who was very badly injured in an attack, and then there was a bomb at my, uh, at my father's pub and a young woman was killed. Um, so we had all these things going on, and that the drama of that, and um, the fact that it was, in a sense, out of your control, these were things that, you know, I wasn't deciding to kill anybody, thank God, um, but somebody was deciding to try and kill us um, and, um, and, and people around us. And I was, I'm a solutions driven person. Um, I like, I see, a, I see a problem and I think, well, how can we navigate our way to the end of that? How can we get through that? And I could see around me, people were reaching for the old playbook, particularly young men reaching for the old playbook, which was you get a gun, you join a paramilitary organization and you go out and you make things worse. And which is what a lot of them did. And um, I, I just thought, honestly, I believe then, as I believe now, that that was the ultimate in stupidity. And it was uh, not just a zero sum game, but it inflicted on the community such misery, such raw, you know, raw, almost at times it seemed unhealable woundedness. And, um, you know, and in particular, whenever the IRA became involved, um, uh, and these were people who believed in the United Ireland, and, and you're killing and maiming and bombing the people that you'd hope to persuade to live in that United Ireland. I could never get my head around the stupidity of that. Um, and so um, I, I was always looking for other ways, and, and I was very fortunate that I, although I grew up in Ardoin, which is regarded and very often characterised as a Catholic ghetto, uh, only part of that, that is true. That the other side, there are two sides of the road. One side was the Catholic ghetto and one side was the Protestant ghetto. Well, I lived in the Protestant ghetto because my parents were so innocent, you know, and innocent of politics in a way that they, um, they bought a house in the, on their first home in the Protestant area. And every time we moved, you know, we moved five times, you know, within a very short, very small radius in our time as the family grew from me to nine. Um, and we always lived in the Protestant side of our town. So um, my, my, my friends growing up, my hinterland growing up, you know, was that, um, that great array of, you know, Protestant um, from, from the Gospel Hall right the way through, to, you know, to the First Presbyterian, Second Presbyterian, Methodist, um, the, the Church of Ireland. And as I said, my father's uh, greatest friend, uh, long dead, now God rest him, um, was at the local, a local um, uh, Church of Ireland minister. Um, so I grew up, in a sense, in a different, in a different space, and I also knew that um, I, I, I never ever wanted to hate my Protestant neighbours, you know, because I loved so many of them. They were great friends, and uh, you know, my sister, two of my sisters were bridesmaids to two of our local Protestant friends, and one of them, um, a family, a Plymouth Brethren family, um, regrettably, their son joined um, a paramilitary organisation. And went out one night in anger um, after I think the Birmingham bombings, I think possibly the Birmingham bombings, certainly some bombing carried out by the IRA. And they went out and killed four Catholics. And they mistakenly killed a Protestant man walking past the Catholic chapel, thinking he was a Catholic, he was a neighbor of ours. And um, I just thought, this is just so 
ridiculously, endlessly, inhumanly stupid. But, you know, here we are with the benefit of education now. Um, with the massification of third level education, we have a young, um, I was part of that generation that Seamus Heaney describes in the poem from the Canton of Expectation, who'd gone, you know, who weren't going to spend their, you know, we weren't, we weren't going to um, file our lives away with our heads, you know, resting against the flanks of milking cows. We were going to go to college and university and onto the professions. And I was thinking, we've all this newly released intellectual energy and confidence and I also had great faith. I mean, I was brought up in the Christian tradition and I had great faith in the idea of love as a healer. And I thought, well, why don't we put all that together and, and build a bridge to each other um, that it, no matter how bad our problems, can they really be that bad that we have to kill and bomb and maim one another? It just seemed to me so ludicrously, as I said, stupid. I can't put any on it. Um, it, was and, natural, uh, it was a natural theme then that this is just so obvious to build a bridge, invite yes. people in, and it really and build, Exactly, Margaret, and build it to the people who, from whom you are estranged. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world to build a bridge, you know, to the people who agree with you, but the people who are your neighbours from whom you are estranged. And as I got older, of course, I got more and more involved in issues to do with reconciliation. I was in the, the, the two sets of the, 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 the Irish Council of Churches, which represents the the Protestant churches and the Catholic um, Episcopal, the Catholic Church, um, uh, separate, those, two, those two separate bodies asked me to, to along with a colleague, a man called John Lampen, um, we were asked to um, co-chair a working party on sectarianism. And we were a group of really very committed Christians who, from all those traditions, who sat down to look, to, you know, to, to turn the, turn the spotlight internally on each of ourselves and our traditions to see could we find, first of all, the sources, the historic mm -hmm. sources and, uh, and the reasons for all this. Could we lay them out honestly? And then could we, could we navigate a way to get out of this using the great commandment to love one another, you know, which um, all of us at least notionally subscribe to. So I had that, I had that background um, and have been working on that. And I mean, I wasn't naive enough to think that um, it would work overnight, but I knew when I got into the presidency that the role of president in Ireland, you know, it's, it has a strong pastoral end, to, you could say to it, you know, it's, it's in a space above politics. Mm -hmm. You're not associated with day-to-day -day politics, um, but you are a, more than a figurehead. Um, you are, the, in some ways, there's a, I said, there's a pastoral element to it. And I could see that the role of president um, could be very powerful, particularly for um, engagement with um, Northern Protestants, Northern Loyalists, um, who, who felt, felt so distant and estranged from the Republic of Ireland and so fearful of it. And here was I, you know, the girl growing up in Belfast, and there I was now in Dublin, translated into the president of Ireland. That must have perplexed them. And it's certain, but I was very fortunate that precisely because I had loads of Protestant friends. Yeah. Um, they came on board with that and helped Martin and I, my husband and I, who worked, he worked 100% on this too, to try well, and we, penetrate all those layers of estrangement and draw them into French. I wasn't trying to turn them into an Irish Catholic or an Irish nationalist. I'd had enough of being proselytized and evangelized, you know, by, by but whether it's church or state, um, you know, enough of that. Uh, I all think that was quite inimical in Northern Ireland. I just wanted to be friends and good friends and good neighbours because none of us were going anywhere. We're always going to be living together next door. And there's no point in living cheek by jowl in ignorance and fear of one another when with a little bit of effort, you know, we could share a cup of tea and a bun and a scone and, and well, thank you for that. actually enjoy each other's company. Yeah, well, thank you for the courage and, and the fortitude to stick with it and look what came out the other side. And, and so it's really, really courageous and, and, and beautiful. And, and as you talked though through, you talked about a playbook and switching from the old playbook of Irish politics to the old boys, old fem and, and female playbook. You've also had a lot of instances that you've talked about where you've experienced nasty language, you've been sneered at for being a woman in various careers. And, and what advice do you have for folks that, because this still exists, 
And what advice do you have where now it's almost gone from overt, sometimes to microaggressions, and, and how do we build our women up and be ready to take that on and build those bridges and a new playbook? What, what's your thoughts on that? I, increasingly, I think you have to call it out. That, and it's the same with all of these isms, whether it's racism, sectarianism, sexism, that if you don't call them out, if you let these things happen around you in the company that you're in, if you don't address them and call them out, then your silence is taken as consent. And that consent opens up more space for more racism, more sexism, more sectarianism. So with all of them, I do believe that you have to call them out. And I think it can be a difficult thing to do. It can also be a dangerous thing to do. But um, honestly, in my own life, I have found that the best thing you know, is to just call it out, call it for what it is. And, um, and it's, it's, you know, whether you're in the workplace and people are being sexist or, or sectarian, you have to be, or homophobic, um, we have to be, in order to stop that toxin you know, from colonizing more space, we are the people who, in that instant, in that moment, are called to be the people who say, actually, you know, hang on a minute. Do you see that, what you're after saying there? I hope you don't mind me saying, but I find that quite offensive. Could yes. you just think about it for a moment and think about the damage that, that those words do? I mean, I had this conversation, believe it or not, with a Pope um, who thought that he was being funny. And it was Pope John Paul. I mean, everybody in the world respected Pope John Paul, as did I. Um, I mean, he was a, her a heroic figure. And the last thing I expected when I went to visit him um, in uh, 1998, um, I think, yeah, it was actually, it wasn't that long after I had been in Canada. Uh, it was actually, early 1999, I went to visit him. And honestly, I was so taken aback uh, when um, it turned out that he had rehearsed a joke. This is what happened. He had rehearsed a joke. And the joke was that he was going to say to my husband, as he did, um, uh, you know, would you not prefer to be president of Ireland rather than married to the president of Ireland? And he gave a great laugh. And then I think he realized instantly, no, 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 you know, it's not going down very well. And um, I had been warned before we went in to meet him, luckily enough, that um, by, Monsign by now Cardinal Harvey, that, that, he ha that there was something a bit different about today, but that day, and he said to me, be prepared for anything. So um, when I went in, um, when I, I didn't say anything to him that immediately, um, you know, I, because the cameras were there and we were smiling for, you know, for, you know, for the diplomatic moment um, of our first meeting. And, but when I went into his study for a private conversation with him, I did say to him, um, you know, Holy Father, that really wasn't acceptable. I don't think you would have said that to a man. Yeah. And he was desperately apologetic. He said to me, look, um, uh, that his English wasn't great and he'd rehearsed a joke. He said, I heard you have a great sense of humor. And I said, yes, I do. But, you know, I've discovered there are limits to it. And yeah. one of those limits is um, the presumption that you can make a sexist joke and I'll take it. And um, so he was, in fairness, you know, he was so apologetic. He was killed apologizing to me now. He really was. And we parted good friends. But it made the point to me also that no matter what company it is, you do have to be prepared to say, look, I'm sorry, but that's not acceptable. Yep. And, and calling it out. And it, that's it, how you stop it. So, well, it's, like, how, it's, how you, it's how you live with yourself also. I also think it's our responsibility to get to a more equalitarian state around the world in so many areas that we have to call each other out on what is offensive and then we move on from there. Um, so, so let's so. stick with the, the Pope for a moment. And you've got a deep faith, but yet you, you yes. can be critical of organized religions. And you've been particularly critical of the Catholic church. How do you reconcile those two? I don't think there's a problem. Anybody who knows the history of the Catholic Church will know that, you know, that uh, members of it have over over time, there have been plenty of critics of it and, uh, and with good reason. Um, you know, it's an institution that has um, a wonderful history. I mean, it is the biggest NGO in the world that does phenomenal work in five continents, um, you know, hugely influential, one of the key influencers in the world. And all of that, you know, there's a lot of that is to the good. 
but historically, you know, it has had um, it. Uh, there's a dark side to its history, um, a, a dreadful. I, mean, I think, particularly in relation, for example, to anti-Semitism, um, to attitudes to individual human rights, um, the, the attitude, you know, right up until the end of the 19th century, that the church believed that um, God intended the entire world to be run by the Pope, you know, both both temporally and spiritually, and you know, they, and, and all of that. It has uh, uh, all of that history. Um, and yet it also has a good side to it. And, uh, but as we know in recent times, not just in Ireland, but in Canada too, uh, the church has had its really very, very dark side, that bleak side that thankfully with education now today and media and, um, and justice systems and human rights systems and advocacy, um, people who in the past suffered in silence, whether it was in mother and baby homes or in institutions run by the Catholic church or in schools, who put up with a physical abuse and sexual abuse that was covered up? That all now has come to light. So it's a t- you know it, it's it is it, put it like this: it is an institution that is not and never should be beyond accountability. Uh, after all, it claims to be created by God for the purpose of bringing the good news of salvation to the world, and um, and it's not used to being held to account. Um, and it certainly worked better. You know, its system worked better at a time when it worked on fear and control and imposing obligations to obedience on people in past generations. That doesn't work with this generation. We grew up knowing that when the magisterium of the church, that the bishops tell us that we have to be obedient to their teaching, we kind of go, yeah, what teaching would that be exactly now? Uh, Which one of those teachings is it now? Because you see some of them, no, not convinced by them, really. And, And here's the thing. If you read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I have freedom of conscience, I have freedom of opinion, freedom of belief, freedom of religion, freedom to leave a religion, freedom to change religion. But the Catholic Church, um, which I love in so many ways, because it's, you know, it's woven into my identity. um, uh, It has never really, well, not really, it hasn't at all adapted itself um, to that reality. And it still operates out of a model which says, you know, you're baptized shortly after birth. And baptism is a wonderful gift, I think. It's a great, the, the idea that, you know, you're, you, you have this God, grace from a, a loving God for the rest of your life, you know, that's always going to be with you. But it's a, the important thing is, Margaret, it's gratuitous. It's a gift. And then along come the canon lawyers on the day you're baptized and they say, yeah, well, hang on a minute. Here's a contract that you're going to sign now uh, and you're going to become a Catholic for life. And you're going to sign away your right to freedom of conscience because we're going to inform your conscience. And we're going to tell you what to think and believe about a whole list of things. Um, we're, going to, we're going to tell you what to believe. We're going to tell you you must be obedient to the magisterium. And we're going to do that when you're you know, two weeks old and you haven't a clue what's going on. Well, you can't do that anymore. I mean, it's a ridiculous phenomenon. And the church has never disaggregated the gift part from the canon lawyer part, the legal part, which is what that's the area I write in and research in nowadays. Um, insisting uh, that we disaggregate these things because for for my generation and hopefully for your generation you know who are um who are educated and capable of critiquing capable of sifting uh, and nuancing um i think it's a much healthier thing for the church if it operates by way of invitation to you invitation to me to believe rather than saying oh, well you were you were baptized and you're now obliged to believe and, and to be obedient. I think that culture of obligation is fundamentally what is wrong in the church and it needs to shift to a culture of invitation. That I think would make such a, a wonderful difference. And it is, it, and it's such a welcoming statement though to talk about a culture of invitation. Isn't it though? So many wonderful things come from being invited and willingly participate in something. And, and Rather the, than being fearful, I mean, the very idea of being, you know, uh, as so many people were um, uh, and possibly still are, um, held by the fear um, uh, and control. Um, and I think that controlling, we, that became so evident in the, you know, in all the reports around the world, the, the commissions and reports on clerical child sex abuse, and in particular, Episcopal mismanagement, you know, the covering up of all that, the having so little regard for the poor victims and such high regard for offending priests and religious. And I think that, um, that tells us what happens when your structure 
is overwhelmed by concern about control of people yeah. rather than care and compassion and and holding people gently in your open hand. But remember that years ago, I remember one of the things whenever I was being very impressed by somebody who told me, you know, that if you hold sand in the palm of your hand, you can hold, it'll stay there. But if you grasp it tightly, it sits, you know, it's, it uh, fizzles away through your fingers. And that has always struck me as a very good metaphor, a very good image for the church. Too tight a control. We've seen what happens now. The generations that um, have lost trust in the episcopacy have, you know, and who also know that they have all these freedoms. Many of them just walk away now. Um, I choose not to. I choose not to because at the end of the day, it is, you know, it's the biggest Christian denomination in the world. It's the only faith system that has permanent representative status in the United Nations. Extraordinary. Um, it represents 1.2 or almost 1.3 billion people in the world. You know, and it represents 600 million women. Yeah. Mm. And what not if well, a, a not well. <laughs> well, not well, but not well yet. We'll leave it at that. But We're if... going to get there. I, you know, um, gee, I mean, imagine uh, just last week, the Pope appointed the first woman uh, undersecretary to a synod who might actually, but we're not terribly sure yet, but we think she might, if there is a coming synod, she might have a vote, and in which case she'd be the first woman ever of those 600 million to have a vote. But we're all jumping up and down. Actually, we're not with delight. We're thinking, yeah, it's all right. You know, one is a, it's a modest start. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it is a start. And if I tie it back to some of the opening comments, that my last question is, you know, here we are celebrating the Feast of St. Bridget, celebrating spring renewal, the spring that hopefully will come to Canada any day now. What, what are your aspirations for women generally? And, you know, what are, what are you hoping for as part of this renewal and spring? And what final thoughts do you want to leave us with? Well, um, for me, it is that that one of these days the world um, will be driven by the, the, the energy of men and women working together. You know, I believe that God created, um, it's like, a, you know, he created like a bird with two wings, you know, that's humanity, two wings. And if you've ever seen a bird flying on one wing um, or with a broken wing, it's a pretty miserable looking phenomenon. And our world, you know, it's pretty battered. It's, um, you know, um, some of us, um, you, could, you could, if you looked around the world, you could get pretty depressed about some of the stuff that's going on. But on the other hand, you, if you look, you can see the light and you can see the green shoots and you can see the people who work for human rights, who insist, you know, that we take care of the world, we take care of the climate, we take care of this ancient earth that, you know, that we have damaged so much. Um, and I think that the voice of women um, in places that they have been excluded from and the genius of women, and I don't, I don't, pretend that they all agree or that they will all bring the same charisms far from it um you know you're talking to somebody who grew up in maggie thatcher's united kingdom you know so you know and um, but it's it's the fact of in places where women and their and their talents and their charisms are excluded we're not using the gifts and the giftedness of our world and we've seen now you're a classic example of a woman who has done wonderfully well you know, in the world of technology. And there are increasingly more and more women showing their metal, showing what they're made of. And, and working together side by side with men, we begin to see what happens when the bird flies on two wings. You know, it gets direction, it gets elevation, it gets speed, it can see things better. You know, it can have a view of the landscape better than being, you know, parked on the ground, flapping around. Um, and particularly when one of those wings is doing its best to keep the other one down, which is the culture I came from and the culture that currently exists still regrettably in the Catholic Church, but I think is shifting. Um, and it's shifting um, just like, you know, all those, all those awful commission, uh, the awful um, stories about clerical abuse and all the rest of it. We didn't hear any of those stories from the church, I regret to say. We'd still be in ignorance if we were waiting on the church to tell us, but they came from educated lay people, people who stood their ground, people who were victims, who wouldn't walk away, who fought for equality and justice and to get their story told. And I think that's going to be the future, people who stand their ground until we're flying on two wings. 
Well, flying on two wings, I think that that's just such a, a beautiful note to end on. I huge, huge thank you. It was just really, really wonderful. Oh, thank you for the chance to, and a huge big thank you to everybody in the Ireland Park Foundation who do such phenomenal work to keep Ireland and Canada in as cousins to each other, as friends to each other, as family to each other. I'm so grateful for all the people who have um, tuned in on Zoom to listen to us. No, it's um, I'm, I'm I hope they all stay well and stay COVID free and get vaccinated and that we get our lives back. I, I second that and I'll say hi to all my 50 cousins who got wind of this happening. And so hello <laughs> to all my cousins in Dublin. So really wonderful. I'll say hi to all mine in Halifax. There you go. We'll do that. And I'm going to hand it back to Mary Margaret. Thank you so much. Good to talk to you, Margaret. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much, Margaret. And thank you. And Mary, you're not off the hook yet. And I have to say hi to my daddy -o in Collingwood. He's on the line, apparently. <laughs> so we have a question from Ireland Park Foundation. And um, one of the key missions of the Ireland Park Foundation is to celebrate the Irish heritage in Canada and to build bridges of friendship, culture, and commerce between Canada and Ireland. What role do you think the Irish um, diaspora can play in the future of Ireland and the future of Canada? And how can the links be, between Ireland and Canada be strengthened? Yes, I think it's wonderful to see the imagination now that is being brought to bear on precisely that question. Um, in every generation of Irish people who emigrated to Canada, um, almost the first thing they did would have been to set up some small organization to help the next generation coming in and to keep, keep that sense of identity, but also to welcome and to make people feel uh, in, in what was initially a strange land, to make them feel welcome and to, to feel, part of, um, feel part of that big Irish community. I think uh, the, the nature of immigration has changed now. The kind of people who are who are coming to Canada now, um, this uh, extravagantly clever and well-educated generation. Um, I think it's wonderful to see the way the, the imagination that has been brought to bear on, uh, and, and also the generosity of spirit. For example, I mean, it was wonderful to see um, the famine memorial. That it was, you know, it was the the best educated and the, the these um, these um, young and middle-aged. Uh, people um, with a love of Ireland, but not for and, and who were living reasonably comfortable lives, good lives, but not wanting to forget um, what what, the, what ground they stand on, what history they stand on, wanting to celebrate and to commemorate those who had much more difficult lives and much more difficult times as a reminder, but also as an act of love, I think. Um, it was a great, uh, it was just a wonderful thing to be involved in the opening of that wonderful memorial, you know, the, um, the uh, Ron Gillespie Memorial, just stunning. Um, and so I think that those kind of initiatives and the work that is currently um, in train with the, uh, with the Ireland uh, Park Foundation, but also um, uh, Robert mentioned earlier that um, just a few months ago, um, I was so fortunate. I was the, um, I gave the inaugural Darcy McGee Beacon Lecture um, online um, in uh, St. Michael's, um, St. Michael's College. And, um, but we, all, we also announced that day um, uh, the, 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 um, the creation of 20 new uh, fellowships to encourage young researchers and academics and um, to, give them, to give them a chance um, to, um, to research in the area of Irish Canadian links. And not just history, um, but also to look at you know the contemporary world and what what they can bring to that and how they can advance ideas around a future um, which keeps Ireland and Canada held in thrall to each other. And I think that thrall is important, you know, never to lose the wonder about each other. Um, so uh, you know the Irish diaspora are absolutely key to that because very often you're looking for. Um, ideas, you're looking for funding, you're looking for, you're looking for people like the people who are involved in the Ireland Park Foundation, you're looking for volunteers to get involved, get involved in committees, do the fundraising, organize the galas. That's all hard work, you know, that's all really hard work. But it's hard work you undertake with a passion um, for the outcome, for what you're able to do with that. Um, the friendships you build, the networks you build that get bigger and bigger and bigger, and that draw in 
um, the very best of the diaspora, the very best of our global Irish family, um, given, given their best to Canada and, and keeping a weather eye out, eye out for Ireland at the same time. So I, th I think, you know, we're so fortunate that this generation who, um, you know, who could so easily just say, well, you know, I've got my nice job, I've got my good education, I don't really need to get involved in any of this, but they don't say that, you know. They have such generosity of spirit, they really want to get involved and they do. I think that's the most fascinating thing. That's fantastic, thank you. That's so hopeful, especially in this, this time. Um, I have a couple uh, questions from the audience if we have time. Sure, by all means, yes. Um, so, whoops, my dog is now barking. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, one is actually from Eamon McKee. You would know. Oh, hello, Eamon. How are you? Yes, good to, good to talk to our ambassador. <laughs> he can't speak, but I will <laughs> try endeavor to speak for him by asking his question. But our new uh, Irish ambassador to Canada, who we're very happy to welcome. Um, uh, thank you for your insights and encouragement to be courageous. The Ireland in which I grew up is now uh, more more courageous, more progress is needed, but we have made great strides with gender and diversity in recent years. What do you think has been key to these changes? Hmm. First of all, people standing their ground, you know, people deciding that, to take a very simple thing, um, I was involved in the uh, setting up the campaign for homosexual law reform back in the um, uh, 1970s. There were people also who were involved in campaigns for women's liberation, for um, access to contraception, uh, all of these things that see, nowadays we look at them and think, dear Lord, you know, how, you know, how unadvanced we were then. But we wouldn't have advanced unless people were prepared to say, look, do you see that? That's not acceptable anymore. We have to change, we have to move, and we have to respond to people's needs, and we have to respond to their rights. And, and in doing that, we had to dismantle um, age-old thought processes, age-old systems of control and laws um, and that took a lot of courage for people to do that, but they did it. And they didn't give up, even though, I mean, going back to the days of suffragacy, as you remember, you know, historically, they were, they were, they were treated badly. They were treated appallingly. And so there's always, there's always when, when you set out down the road of changing things, there is always that time when people don't really want change. It's, you know, to, to stay the way you are is easier. Change, I mean, you know, you have to think there's effort uh, taken. But I think um, what has happened with Ireland, um, uh, one of the big, big um, changes that happened in Ireland was the advent at the end of the 1960s in the Republic of Ireland um, of second, free second level education and then the explosion and massification of third level education, giving uh, generations, this, which I say Seamus Heaney calls the intelligence as brightened and unmannerly as crowbars, launched onto the world, great problem solvers, confident you know, with the confidence that comes from education and having access to professions and being more sure of your future in many ways. Um, and then the other great thing that I found, particularly during the more recent referenda um, on abortion and on same-sex marriage, uh, bearing in mind that we'd had a number of previous um, uh, referenda on abortion and also on divorce, and um, uh, way, you know, went to the 80s and 90s, and um, in the past, when those issues were raised, um, churchmen, bishops, uh, would have been almost first into the fray saying, here are the rules and you can't abandon the rules. And, and, and they were still quite powerful. But in more recent times, the debate took on a completely different shape. And that shape was people saying, would you please listen to my story? You know, the story of people coming out who had experienced the, the awful um, loneliness of being gay, you know, in homes that were homophobic or in, 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 in a culture, uh, whether it was, you know, a footballing culture or a workplace where they were hearing homophobic things or worse still schools, because schools still are the most problematic area for homophobic thought bullying, um, uh, hearing their stories. And because of social media and of course the huge reach of the media. And also I think because we're a talkative people, as you can see, um, and we chat and we chat intergenerationally because we do have these big clans. And you know what? Like good ideas do get thrashed around the table. There was a greater openness to listening to those stories. And I think the power, the sheer, 
overwhelming power appealed to the Irish people and that because comp- they have a natural compassion always for the underdog, you know, and um, I think that has driven um, that has helped to drive um, a greater openness. And of course, the, the diminishing power of the, you know, of the of the of the church and the churches in Ireland, um, because on all these issues, they've been on the other side of, of, of change. You know, they have resisted change, as it were. Though I have to say, in fairness to the then Archbishop of Dublin, he was the first bishop I heard to say during the same-sex marriage referendum, the first bishop I ever heard to say in Ireland, the time is gone when bishops tell people how to vote. You know, I grew up in a time when they had, they were perfectly... <laughs> They were they were very, very quick to tell people how to vote. Um, so that was that's also a big change. But Eamon, I think and I don't know whether you agree with me, but I do think that um, education, the, the, op- the, the opening up um, of um, third of second and third level education and education generally in Ireland was such a big key. It was the watershed. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And maybe just one more question. Um, although we could spend the whole night with you. <laughs> so maybe we will do phase two of this. Um, can you comment on the parallels, if any, with the events unfolding in Washington currently and the troubles in Ireland? The events unfolding in what? Isn't it a strange thing you should say that? Because um, I, here's the thing. I was working in Notre Dame in Indiana in 2015 when Donald Trump ran for election. And um, Mike Pence was governor, and uh, I didn't, I, I don't, I didn't know the man, but I did not like his policies. I didn't like his attitude to homosexuals, um, his attempt to try and stop same-sex marriage. I didn't like his attitude to immigrants wanting to keep them out of Indianapolis or Indiana. And um, and then and Trump, um, my husband and I looked at him, and we said, what, what he reminded us of was Paisley. In our day, in back in Belfast, when he was the the stirrer upper, um, you know, the demagogue, and nobody was saying they would vote for him, but they all did. And we realised, uh, in when we were in, in Indiana, we knew he was going to win the election. And we, I had cousins who were involved in democratic politics in Boston. We went up and we saw them, and we said, please, 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 get behind Hillary Clinton. Um, please support her because. Um, he's going to win. And they said to us, oh, no, 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 you don't understand the American system. You know, that's not what's going to happen. We went and saw our friend, the American ambassador and appointee of uh, Barack Obama. And we said to him, please, we think this man's going to win because we recognize in him the, pheno- the same kind of phenomenon, the man who can stir up. Unfortunately, he stirs up a kind of a, just the worst in us, you know. Um, and, um, you know, he, 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 he and so anyway, that's what we said. And we were told again, no, you don't understand. And then he won. And we were, I, frankly, I mean, I, I just say I was, you know, I was pretty devastated. Um, uh, and uh, now we have Joe Biden, who I think and I believe will be, um, uh, first of all, I think he's certainly the most experienced man ever to hold the office. Secondly, I think he will be exactly what is needed for a very broken and hurt and divided America. He'll be a pastor. He's a pastoral man. He suffered deeply, deeply in his own life, deeply. And he has pushed through it and he's able to offer his life in service to the people. And uh, no amount of grief and tragedy has diminished him, but it has done the opposite. It has enhanced him as a human being. And I think out of that come depths of compassion, but also a fierce determination, Um, you know, anti-racist, anti-sexist, uh, a man, a man who who understands the, I think very well the 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 importance of loving one another, and who will bring that um, bring that to bear. And I think the people in his administration are wonderful. Um, I'm so there's a lot of Irish people in there, and uh, um, uh, I, I just am so uh, captivated by the um, the quality of people he has around him. And so yes, the, I think there are. Uh, interestingly, you should say that because it's not an immediate thing you would think of. Um, but calling out is important. And so I do think that no matter how, no matter what happens um, in the, you know, in, um, on Capitol Hill, 
with these hearings, this hearing, um, it had to happen. People had to call out um, all that stirring up of, of things that are not humanly good and that are deeply divisive and also deeply dangerous. Um, so no matter what happens, no matter what the outcome, I think history will judge these days well. Thank you very much. And that's a really interesting what you say about Paisley. Yes. Yeah, no, in fairness to him, you know, by the end of his days, Paisley was an awful stirrer up and a demagogue and really responsible for stirring up sectarian troubles at the very beginning, certainly in the, in the uh, mid to mid 60s onwards. But then he underwent a really deep personal conversion to peace and he became a very important player in the peace process and indeed a first minister. Um, uh, working alongside a man that nobody ever thought he would work with, who was the, a former chief of staff of the IRA. So I believe in miracles, you know, as, as Seamus <laughs> Heaney says, you know, miracles and healing wells. Well, that's a great way to end, end our event. And I just want to thank you, um, Mary, for, for joining us from across the pond. And we hope to see you in person one day. All oh, please, goodness everyone in person and thank you to everyone who's attending apparently we have over 250 um fans of uh, mary mcleese on the on the line right now and um again thank you to our clever interviewer uh, margaret stewart and of course uh mary mcleese we've learned so many fascinating things from you and um i hope that people can learn more by reading your book um and so I would encourage everyone to pick up uh, Mary's book. Uh, I just finished it myself. <laughs> and um, pick it up from your local neighborhood uh, bookstore because we really want to uh, support local businesses always, uh, mm -hmm. but especially now. And this is uh, Ben McNally has uh, a large stock of uh, Mary's books. So there's a, a place to find them. And please keep um, on the lookout for future Ireland Park uh, foundation events and um, stay safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. God bless. <laughs>